I send my greetings to you this morning, and, and I'm about to state the, the obvious. Our world has changed. Norms have been disrupted. Social life coming to a screeching halt. Worldly pleasures and pursuits stopped. Dreams and goals put on hold. And in the midst of all these things, there's the, of these ex- external realities in our life, we are also a people that is engulfed with internal conflicts. We have the gut-wrenching what-ifs of a not uh, certain tomorrow. We have the economic uh, uh, turmoil that we are experiencing daily that's keeping us awake. There's the painful anxiety over the future, and we could go on more and more and more as we describe uh, the inward conflicts and workings of people all around us and even Christians. As you look around and you see all these external and internal uh, workings, uh, they have one thing in common. They make us afraid. They make us afraid. And when it comes to God's word, he's not left us to ourself in our fear. He has much to say about being afraid. Much to say. And so in light of the times in which we're living and uh, with the coronavirus um, pandemic, I sense it was important that we would go away from our, our normal series in Ephesians and begin a series titled, When I Am Afraid. When I Am Afraid. And what we'll do, uh, as the Lord allows, we'll look at various examples of those uh, uh, being afraid in the Scripture, and then we'll see how they dealt with it. And we'll see what God has to say uh, to us during fearful times and the ever-present temptation of falling prey to sinful fear and being afraid. And we're going to start this morning with Psalm 56. Psalm 56. Uh, in Psalm 56, we have David who is very, very afraid. Saul is pursuing him. Uh, he's pursuing him for his death. Uh, David has killed Goliath. He is fleeing, and he's fleeing by fear, and he's running to Gath, the very city uh, where Goliath had lived. And in Psalm 56, we have David crying out in his fear. And from this psalm, we can gain a lot of good, encouraging help about fear, about being afraid. And so we're going to look at uh, Psalm 56. The context, if you want to know, it's in 1 Samuel 21 and 22. Uh, That will give you uh, an understanding of the historical setting, why David was afraid. But with that, we're going to look at two things. One, we want to look at the realities of being afraid. With that, the causes and effects of being afraid And then we want to also look how David confronts being afraid, confronts fear by faith, and becomes victorious. The first thing we need to note is the realities of being afraid. Now you may say, well, Jim, I know. I mean, I'm I'm aware of that. But it's important that we really dig deep down in this issue of being afraid, of what it means to be enslaved to, to, to sinful fear. And in verse 3 and verse 11 of Psalm 56, David says, When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. In God I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Now there's two quick observations we need to to, to see in this statement by David. Number one is that faith and fear may coexist. David says, When I am afraid, that's his condition, And then he immediately says, I will put my trust in you. That's his resolve. So don't don't believe that you don't have faith just because you fear. Charles Spurgeon has said, it is possible then to fear, for fear and faith to occupy the mind at the same moment. We are strange beings and our experience in the divine life is stranger still. We are often in a twilight where light and darkness are both present. And so David immediately gives us some good counsel, is to acknowledge the reality of being afraid. But within the reality of being afraid, there's also the call to resolve a faith by which we can conquer being afraid and conquer fear. So under the, uh, the title of the realities of being afraid, let's take a look at the causes. What are some of the causes why we are prone to be a fearful people during times such as this or in other times in our life? And I want to offer to you three causes why we easily become afraid. Now, in verses 1 and 2 and 6 and 7, David is acknowledging the source of his, uh, of his fear. He said, Be gracious to me, O God, for man has trampled upon me. 
Fighting all day long, he oppresses me. My foes have trampled upon me all day long, for they are many who fight proudly against me. He goes on and says, they attack, they lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited to take my life. David has very real foes. He has very real you know, enemies after him. And though we may not have the same physical uh, enemies coming after us, we still suffer being afraid like David. And here are three causes, even with God's children, why we often fall prey to slavish fear, why we are afraid. And the first cause of our, of our being afraid is our fallen nature, our fallen nature. When sin entered the world in the Garden of Eden, catastrophic results occurred. And one of those is the slavish fear or of being afraid. Listen to what God tells us uh, uh, after the fall. Genesis 3, 8 through 11. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? When did Adam make his confession of being afraid? It was after the fall. Imagine for a moment what life would be without ever being afraid. That you never feared anything. It was a foreign experience. That's exactly what Adam had before the fall. He had forfeited it. And as a result, we find that the fallen nature of humanity is, is, is a breeding ground for fear and of being afraid. But I think you must go a little deeper in that. Why, why did Adam become afraid? Why did he pass down uh, to all of us this, 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 sense of, this fallen nature that drives us to being afraid? What was behind that? The reason why that we're afraid due to our fallen nature is because we're separated. We're separated from the only one that can calm our fears. He, there is only one source of peace in tumultuous times. There's only one way to calm the raging th thoughts and, and, and the unrest of heart, and that is through the gospel of the Lord Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. This certainly has implications uh, for us today. It's important that we as Christians remember that the coronavirus has not taken us off our mission. The coronavirus has not relieved us of the responsibility of the gospel in our culture. The fallenness of humanity ensures that people will be afraid. And when we look around and there are people afraid, we see it in their faces. If anything, this pandemic has increased the opportunities for the church of Jesus Christ to be about the only way to be relieved of fear. It is through the gospel. People are afraid and people are hopeless and people will listen to us. Oh, beloved, these are not times to cower in fear. These are times to be fearless, loving our neighbors with and towards the gospel. Why? Because the only way to overcome the first cause of being afraid is by the gospel. But there's another reason why we are afraid. Not only is it because of our sinfulness, but it's because of the circumstances or the seen circumstances around us. As I mentioned, you see fear in everyone's face. There is one circumstance that has united all of us in the days in which we live. There is one thing that has even united the world, and it is the coronavirus. And for those without Christ, there is a unity of fear. A unity of fear. And Christian, this is where we must break unity with the fearful world. And to do that, in order uh, to break free out of that and be separate and provide the hope that the people need to hear and see from us, 
then we got to be very careful that we don't overdose on news and all we see in the world. Because if we overdose in that area and all we're getting is, is seen circumstances and neglecting the word of God and neglecting prayer, then we will succumb to the very fear of our unbelieving friends. And here's the warning. Here's the warning. If we put our hearts and minds more on the circumstances of the world than the assurance of the word, we will be afraid. We will panic We will be hysterical, and we will often call practical wisdom and prudence when actuality we are masking sinful unbelief and fear. I'm not saying don't be wise, and we certainly are honoring the directions of 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 our leaders, but this isn't a time to bunker down and, and, and be off mission. This is a time for opportunities because the circumstances are overwhelming. And God has commanded us, don't be afraid. And if we are more focused on what we see in the world, through the world, instead of through the word, then we will be no different than our unbelieving friends. We must not give in to the circumstances we see. We must see beyond to the God of our circumstances. And could it be that many of us have been been praying for revival? Could it not be that God may use this very thing? to remove all the props and the worldliness that we have, we have fallen prey to. I was thinking about that this morning in my office. You know, and we, we had the, there was a couple guys on the basketball court yesterday and went over to talk to them. They're dear friends. And they said, well, what are, what are you going to do about church ball? He says, we have nothing to do. Everything's been gone. Everything's gone. And I thought from the perspective of a Christian, How wise of God and his ways are not our ways that he would remove the busyness out of our lives and he would remove all the props and all the worldliness so that we could perhaps spend more time seeking his face in revival even. But beloved, if you and I watch around us and become like the unbeliever and fearful and afraid because of the circumstances, then we are no different than God's people of old during the time in Numbers 13 when they were told to go into the promised land. You remember the story, they sent the spies on a recon visit. They go up there and they see that the land is is plentiful beyond description. And they come back, and a couple of them, but only a couple, they were all excited about what had given them, God had given them. But yet there was a large percentage of them that were not. You know the account of Caleb? The people are afraid. They say, no, 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 we can't do this. There's, a, there's great armies up there. We can't, we can't take it. They're too strong. And Caleb quieted the people. This is Numbers 13, 30. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we surely can overcome it. But the pressure of the people, the pressure of the people says, we are not able to do this, for they are too strong for us. We are like grasshoppers in our own sight. What happened there? It was the fearful power of unbelief that went contrary to God's commands as well as God's promises to them. And beloved, you and I will fall prey to the same being afraid as they were if we look around more instead of looking up. Instead of looking unto Jesus, don't look unto the news. Don't look, and I'm not saying don't be educated, but I'm saying don't get a heavy dose of that because you will drift away and you will be afraid. But there's a third cause of being afraid, not only our fallen nature, not only because we focus more on circumstances than Christ, but we also become afraid when we neglect fellowship with the Lord. When we, when we neglect fellowship with the Lord, we will become afraid. And it's perfectly, it perfectly makes sense because if you're not abiding in the one who says, don't be afraid, then the default is you're going to be afraid. Daniel 11 is a very, very important uh, verse. Daniel eleven thirty two, it reads, But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Notice, notice the order of this. They who know God will be empowered and they take action. Conversely, be fretting and, 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 and worrying and being afraid that you neglect the most important relationship in life and that with your God, then you will not have strength. You will be paralyzed 
and these golden opportunities for the gospel will pass. Beloved, we must not be consumed by what's all around us at the expense of time in the Word, prayer, and the ministry of encouragement to other believers. Because if we, do, if we neglect fellowship with the Lord, then we will be paralyzed by fear. We will be weak, and any salt and light opportunity will be forfeited. The disciples knew this type of fear of broken fellowship with the Lord. In John chapter 20, verse 19 through 21, post-resurrection, look what the disciples did. They didn't just start jumping with joy and go out and change the world, not at all. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, what did they do? They locked themselves out from the world out of fear of people, and Jesus, in the wonderful grace that he gives, He comes to them and says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And then notice what he says. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Even in that that first couple days after the resurrection, Jesus says, don't be afraid. I give you peace. And in the strength of that peace that comes from knowing me, I send you into a world that needs to see and hear of me. The Lord has told us in Isaiah 26, 3, that those who keep their mind on him, he will maintain perfect peace. So during this time of great, of great turmoil and the upsetting of our life as we've known it, you must make the relationship with Jesus Christ the most important thing in your life if you haven't. And not out of a sense of desperation that when he delivers you or he removes this off of us that we go back to norm. I don't think we should ever go back. This should be one of the, the, the strongest wake-up calls for Christians that perhaps we have been too apathetic. We've been too worldly. Maybe God is going to do all this so that he can bring us to see that the most treasured thing in all of life is a close walk with him. Beloved, like I mentioned, and I can't stress this enough, if you and I are not walking close to him, then we will be afraid. And that extends to walking close with his people, though we may not be able to physically meet for a short period of time. We have all kinds of means and blessings of modern technology that we need to stay connected, as Gene said. Because if you isolate spiritually, you will die spiritually. I remember growing up as a boy and hunting. You know, we were a hunting family, and at 12 years old, you get your gun. And so I remember uh, um, going out in the fall and and going squirrel hunting with my dad and my grandpa and, and some friends. And we would go out there, and I had my gun, and I was a brave hunter. And we would go out and, and, and w- w- go through the woods, and, and I'd be close to them, and I could always see where my dad was. And I remember uh, the, the first time, he said, you stay here, you stay here, I'm going down there and, uh, and, 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 and hunt. And so I'm there, and I'm all brave as long as I could see where my dad was. But when he stepped over the, uh, the hill and down into, into the hollow, when I couldn't see anymore, it was amazing how the really brave hunter became the, the scaredy cat hunter fast because I couldn't see my dad. I couldn't see the source of comfort. It may be a weak illustration, but it is an illustration. You get out of sight of Jesus and you're going to be afraid. You drift away from looking unto him and you focus more on what you see on a screen than what you're discovering in the world, word, and you're going to be afraid. And you offer no hope to your family, to your friends, and to the world around you. We see the contrast in Peter's life. Remember what happened uh, at the denial? Peter was afraid. And a little servant girl comes and, hey, you were with him. Oh, no, 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 I don't know the man. Succumb to fear, succumb to being afraid. What happens, though, after Pentecost? What happens after the intimacy with Christ is deepened? And it says in Acts 4.13, Now they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood they were uneducated and untrained men, but they took notice that they had been with Jesus. What's the difference between Peter then and Peter now? The difference was the closeness to Christ. Beloved, If you're not close to the one who said, fear not, you'll fear. If you're not close to the one commanding, fear not, then you will fall prey to slavish fear. But obeying the command, fear not, will make us fear not. So that's the causes of of being afraid, those three. The causes is our fallen nature, the circumstances we look at more than Christ, and our neglect of fellowship with him. But what are the effects 
What happens to the, to the believer, and even non-believer, but what happens, what are the effects of being afraid? Well, David gives us a couple. First one, there's sleepless nights. Psalm 56, 8 says, You've taken account of my wanderings or my tossings. I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, a few of us have lost a few winks over this. Maybe all of us or most of us have stared into the ceiling with a racing mind, unable to get to sleep as we think, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What is it? We live these what ifs of what's going to happen. And the more that you do that, and the more that you, you see the effects of being afraid, first sleeplessness, you need to understand that when you lose sleep, and when you become physically weak, you are far more ripe for the attacks of the devil. When fear causes excessive sleeplessness, like David, oh, you see my wanderings and my tossings, then you become weakened in a physical condition. And when you are weak physically, you're prone to depression. And when you're prone to de- depression, then fear accelerates. One of the, the, the severe effects of being afraid is that you will lose sleep and rest. And you put yourself in a dangerous position of spiritual warfare that perhaps you've never known before. So David reveals one of the effects of being afraid. You see my tossings and my turnings. I wonder how many times that he was looking over his shoulder late at night for Saul's men to come after him. But there's another effect of, of being afraid, not only physically with the sleeplessness, but it's also the, uh, the emotional upheaval of being afraid. Again, verse 8, 56 verse 8, you've taken account of my wonderings, my tossings. You put my tears in your bottle. We also see another account that David says, every night I make my bed swim. I dissolve or drench my couch with tears. What we're seeing in the psalmist, and we know by experience, the emotional upheaval when you're afraid. In this case, he talks about uh, the endless crying, the tears that come from that. But the emotional upheaval when you're afraid goes far beyond just shedding tears. Fear produces inward emptiness paralyzing loneliness, a sense of abandonment, the pain of hopelessness, the inner turmoil of unrest, the lack of peace, on and on and on. There are so many, many consequences of fear, emotionally and physically. But David doesn't leave us there. David, in Psalm 56, he transparently and brutally, honestly opens up his heart and says, I'm afraid. And behind that, we see that that being afraid is part of our fallenness. Being afraid is driven by seeing circumstances more than seeing Christ. And, and, And we see that even being afraid will intensify when you drift away from the Lord. And the effects are are significant. It'll affect you physically and it'll affect you emotionally, just like it did David. But David gives us hope. And I want us to flip now and look how David overcomes being afraid. How David confronts fear and overcomes fear, and it's by faith. It's by faith. And it's not, this is not a spiritual fog faith of a generic belief in God. We saw during 9-11 that there was this seemingly unity around. Our churches were filled for what, two weeks? But then life went back to normal. That's not, that's not what David does, and that's not what we're to do either. We are not looking to God and gathering in our in our neighborhoods or gathering you know, um, any, any way we can. We're not just that God would deliver us. And I would argue that we need to pray more that through this, that God would be honored through all this and that we would see him more and more and be closer to him and that he would develop more Christ-like in us. I would, I would pray that we never go back to where we were, that we would, go, we would have a more intensifying desire and passion for Christ. But let's look at what David says. Here's some, here's some ways that we can overcome fear by faith. And the first one, in verse 4, in verse 11 and 56, notice what David does. He talks to himself. In God whose word I praise, in God I put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? In God I put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? David does one of the most important things you can do in the Christian life, and that is learn to talk to yourself, not listen to yourself. You cannot let emotions talk to you. You cannot let circumstances talk to you. 
David does this in another psalm, Psalm 42. Twice he would talk to himself and say, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil with me? Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones says uh, in his book, Spiritual Depression, The main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself. You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. And that's exactly what David is doing. He's showing us the rational nature of fear. Fear and slavish being afraid is irrational. Remember the verse in the Proverbs? There's a line in the street. There's a line in the street. I can't go outside. I can't go. That's what the, 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 the proverb, Solomon is showing the example of someone that is paralyzed by fear that says, I can't even go outside because there's a line in the street. I have not seen a lion walk in the street. That was an imaginary fear. And David confronts his fear by the rational nature of, of faith. And it is rational in the sense that it preaches truth to yourself. For instance, when fear begins to grip you and you feel the the swelling up inside and you want to fret and you want to panic, what does Jesus tell us? Don't be afraid. What did Paul say to Timothy? God's not giving you the spirit of fear. What did God say to Joshua? Be courageous. What does David say to his God when I'm afraid I put my trust in you? This is the most important way that you can begin to be out of the bondage of slavish fear is you must see the rational nature of faith that talks down fear by the truth of God's word. It is talking down your fears in the powerful and liberating truth of the word of God. And that's the first way that we can overcome fear in in fearful times is exercise faith. And the rational nature of faith. The second thing that David does for us is that he models a, God, a Christian, a godly man who knows God is his God, even when things look bad. David exercised faith in the assurance that God is his God. Look at verse 9. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know. He didn't say, well, I hope. Or maybe, he said, no, this I know God is for me. This is the language of certainty. This is the language of confidence. This is the language that will slay slavish fear, knowing that God is our God, that he's not abandoned us. Perhaps the most important fear-killing scripture of assurance is Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. Paul proclaims, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will we not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that includes what we're living in right now. Paul asked in rapid fire fashion five rhetorical questions in this text. And if you would spend time in those The answers to these rhetorical questions will soar you and deliver you from the bondage of being afraid. Number one, who can be against us? No one, because God is for us. Number two, will God hold anything back? No, he gave us his son. Who shall bring a charge to God's chosen? No one, because God justifies. Who is it to condemn? No one, because God indeed has liberated us. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? No one, no thing. David does something for us to encourage us. As he exercises faith in the assurance that God is his God, he has a settled conviction that through thick and thin, God remains his God. And we can too, because God is a covenant God. He will not abandon us. 
but he puts personal responsibility upon us not to give in to fear, but to exercise a bold faith. I know he's my God. I know he's on my side. And if you just wait around for God to zap you out of fear, you are not going to get out of fear. He places personal responsibility on us to exercise faith in what he has provided. And David shows us the way out of fear is to have assurance that God is your God. But notice also in 13, verse 13, what he does. He leans on the faithfulness of God from the past. Verse 13 reads, For you have delivered my soul from death, indeed my feet from stumbling. Not only does he talk to himself truth, but he talks to himself and says, Listen, God was faithful in the past. God did this before. Is he changed? Is, is, he, is he a God now that says, Well, you know what? I'm rethinking this with you, David. Not at all. One of the great comforts or the two greatest comforts in the life of a Christian is the sovereignty of God in all things and the immutability of God, the unchanging nature of God. And whether I waver, which I do, he does not. Paul would lean on this too. Listen to these encouraging words of Paul who was still assured that God was his God. 2 Corinthians 1, 8-10 For we not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experience in Asia, For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. I'm sure there's a lot of people feel that way today. Indeed, we felt that we'd receive the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. Beloved, as you go through this, I would encourage you, don't make your prayer life primarily about God deliver me from this. Make your prayer life, God, what are the lessons you want to teach me and and develop in me through this? And David anchors himself in the certainty that God is his God, and he also remembers the faithfulness of his God in the past. So how do we overcome, overcome fear? Well, let's acknowledge we have it. Let's remember the causes. Think about the effects. And then like David, reason yourself through the rationale of faith. And then get settled in your heart and mind that God is your God. He's not left you. And thirdly, here's a third way that leads us to victory over fear. David exercises faith in the sufficiency of God's word. Verse 4 and 10, in God whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust. See, there's an, there's an inseparableness about this. The word of God connects us to God, and the God of the word connects us to himself. We must understand that when you read the Bible, that's God speaking to you. And so when in fear and in in panic even, that we neglect the Bible, then why do we pray to the God we're neglecting? Beloved, to love the scriptures is to love Christ. To neglect the scriptures is to neglect Christ. And David believes and relies upon the sufficiency of God's word, and so shall we. In God whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust, I shall not be afraid. Do you note the resolve? Do you see the progression in the the psalm? He says, when I am afraid. And then he says, I will trust you. I will praise you for your word. Why can he say that? Because the word of God is sufficient. It is sufficient. It is authoritative. And from the time of creation to the end of human history, to the, to the winding down of redemptive history, God has chosen that he does all things by his word. In the very beginning, he says, let there be, and creation came into being. When it comes to the new creation in Christ, Peter says, we are born again by the incorruptible word. Isaiah tells us, so shall my word go out. It shall not return to me empty. It will accomplish what I purpose. And beloved, when we are fearful, we can run to the promises of God and we can find a soft pillow to lay ourselves and overcome sleeplessness, overcome the effects of fear because God's word is enough. His promises are true. And in the culture we live in, do you know what the world needs to see? Christians who believe that. In 1665, during the great plague in London, Thomas Vinson was a Puritan pastor Death was all around. And Vincent was convinced he had to go and serve and get the gospel to sick and dying people. He immersed himself in the culture. And one of the testimonies was that the dying and the sick were crying out for help in the eternal things and no one was there to minister to them. 
Beloved, the word of God is sufficient. And what do our, our unbelieving friends need to see? Because all they have is the fear of their fallenness. You know what they need to see and hear? They need to hear compassionate, David-like, proclaiming the sufficiency of God's word in times of need as well as in times of plenty. Here's the fourth thing, and this is the final. David also shows us how to overcome fear, and that is by the conquering power of praise. Let me ask you something. Have you recently, in your family worship times, you know, one thing we do have on our hands now, we have time. Let me ask you, have you thanked God for what he's doing in the world right now? Have you looked at, at like the early church when they were persecuted and they were beaten? What did they do? They gathered together and they thanked God that they were worthy to suffer for his name. Now, I, we're not being persecuted. But let me ask you, are you thanking God and giving him praise for what you're gonna learn through this and what he may do through this? He may bring global revival through this. We don't know. But what does David do? In the midst of being afraid, he uses the power of praise. And the reason why, my friends, the reason why praise is so powerful because it takes your eyes off of your circumstances and it puts them where they should be, on the God who is and the God who's in control. David, verse 4, 10, and 12, in God whose word I praise, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, I will render thanksgiving offerings to you. What a wonderful picture of a human being knowing God, fighting through fear, and doing so in the power of the word, doing so in the power of faith, doing so in the power of praise. And we have a fine example of this, and uh, I'll close and wind this down from Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a great book to read during times like this. In chapter three of his book, there's the prayer. Now, early in the chapters, Habakkuk is, is, is complaining to God. There's a dialogue of complaint. But in chapter 3, he comes to prayer. And in chapter 3, in verse 17, Habakkuk is looking ahead. It's the prophecy, it's the, it's the prophecy of what the Chaldeans are going to do to his people. And it's not pretty. He's got a glimpse of the devastation that's going to happen as the Babylonians come upon them. And in verse 17 of Habakkuk, he says, chapter 3, verse 17, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. That sounds bad, real bad. There's desolation throughout the land. The most basic necessities of life are removed. It's chaos. And some of you may be thinking that way now about what's going to bring tomorrow in our land. Some of you may be saying, well, Habakkuk, that's me. That's us. But what does Habakkuk do? He doesn't, he doesn't keep himself horizontal. After he, after he, he describes the, de the devastation that's going to happen, he says, yet, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. What does, what does he do? He praises. He worships. And that shows that the worship is not contingent upon the church. It's not a type of music. It's contingent upon a heart that sees God in all things. And Habakkuk does that. He said, yes, I see around, and it is depressing. It's going to be horrible. Yet I know God, and I shall yet praise him, because he is my help and stay. So, beloved, may God help us and define or, or develop within us an attitude of worship, even more so during this time, because he still sets in the heavenlies, and the earth is still his footstool. Yes, there's challenging times. Yes, there's fear everywhere. But Christians, you and I can break from the world. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be engulfed by the media, engulfed by all the, the things that, that would cause us to be stirred. We don't have to. We can immerse ourselves not in the world, but in the word. And we can become like David. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In your word, I praise. May God help us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word and thank you that in fearful times we have the wonders of the Lord Jesus who said, fear not, for I am with you. Lord, forgive us perhaps when we've drifted too far into the world and we're no, no different than, than our unbelieving friends. Please deliver us from the bondage of slavish fear and, 
And let us find in you the sufficiency that all we need, that your word, the the rationale of faith, the sufficiency of your word, the power of praise, all these wonders, Father, that you've given us in your word. Make us a fearless people that we can bring comfort and hope and be the light and salt in a world that desperately needs to see Christ. We thank you, Father, for the means that we could uh, have church today. And so may we spend our time wisely as we have time. May it be used to seek you in a more earnest way that we might know you in order to make you known. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.